Hey everyone, what is going on? Welcome back to another video here on the channel. In this week's video, we're gonna be taking a look at the steps that we need to take to determine our power system components for a radio controlled airplane. I'm gonna walk you through all the calculations that you need to make so that you can have more of an informed selection for a power system component on your radio controlled airplane. Now the first note that I have here in green is that this calculator and everything that we go through today is primarily for trainer style airplanes and that's the ones that have the wing on the top and are used to help get people into the hobby. This is primarily what most people are building when it comes to radio control airplanes especially for the first time. However I do want to make a point that it does not mean this calculator and everything we go through is not going to work for other types of airplanes. It certainly will and I'll let you know what you have to do in order to change things when we get to those stages and steps. So the way that we're gonna go through this is we're gonna break it down into approximately five steps and that is going to first work out with step one being for the wattage of our airplane. How much power do we need for our airplane in order to have a good type of flight? Step two is the cell count, and we may get into capacity in step two, or we may get into capacity in step three, which deals with the current, and the current is going to be in amps, of course. Step four, we get into understanding what kind of RPM do we need for our prop airplane. This deals with propeller airplanes only for this calculator and everything we talk about, as well as motor KV in step four. And then in step five, we're gonna look at how do we actually select a propeller that is going to be useful for for us and it's good to note that the prop that we select here is going to be a propeller that's going to be safe to start out with that does not mean it's going to be the final propeller that you select for your build propellers are cheap buy a few and test them out to determine which is going to be best for your setup so here we go we're gonna start right off we have to first define our airplane what kind of airplane are we going to be building today well we are going to be following the trainer style airplane this is gonna be a high wing style airplane with a wingspan of 82 inches. So it's quite large and it's going to have an all up weight of 11 pounds. An all up weight means essentially everything for that airplane is included in that weight. And of course, just like everything that we do, it's not an exact science. We may not know the exact amount of weight that this plane is going to be. And that might be because we don't know how heavy our motor and our speed control and our battery pack is. But you can collect a rough idea of that information just by guessing at first and then going through the process and checking to see if everything makes sense and then add up the weight of your power system. And if you come sh too shy, if you don't have enough, then you can go back, reevaluate, bump this up and run through the calculation again. Then you can arrive at something that makes sense for you. So I am expecting that the 82 inch wingspan is gonna have an all up weight of 11 pounds. How do I know that? Well. For this specific airplane, this is a real airplane that I do own and it comes out just around that so I can use this for another airplane of around that same sort of wingspan size. Now it's good to note that the wingspan that we're going to be dealing with and the all up weight that we're gonna be dealing with is going to be limited. There's gonna be a domain that we're gonna work within. That domain, I'm gonna take a look here, it's gonna work within about the 30 to 150, 120 inch wingspan. And that's gonna give you an all up weight of maybe around 30 to 40 pounds max. If you work outside of that weight and wingspan limitation, then the formulas may not work for you. And that's because I've only worked with with a set amount of data that works between that 30 to 115 to 120 inch wingspan. And I made sure that all the calculations work within that range and domain. So now we can go through and take a look at how we actually get to a wattage value here. This is our step one. So step one is going to rely on the information, the formula, and this chart that we have in the bottom right. So the big thing I wanna talk about is this chart. When you break down the performance that you expect out of your airplane, this is where you can deviate between a trainer style airplane if you wish to and move maybe to more of a sport or pattern flying plane or you can go flat out for 3D performance looking at about 150 watts per pound. All these values are amounts of watts that you're gonna want per pound. And as you go from the highest down to the lowest, your lowest is gonna be something that is lightly loaded. This is gonna have a large wingspan. It's gonna have a low 
wing loading to it and you can get away with about 60 watts per pound. In some cases, if you're looking at a sailplane and you want to power it with a small motor, you can go 50 watts or even slightly lower than that as well. So keep that in mind that there are these extra ranges. However, if you're gonna deviate from where it says your basic trainer, somewhere around that 85 watt mark, that's where things are going to change as we get into later steps here. So you can make that selection and base everything off of it now, but you will have to make some changes later as we get to step four and step five. So we take something here off of the chart for our airplane and we're going to look at about the 100 watt performance for our trainer. That's only about 15 points to 15 watts per pound more than the basic trainer. We're gonna look for something that has a little bit more pep, but we don't need that sport flying and aerobatic type performance. So 100 watts per pound is going to work very well for us and we'll still remain within everything that we're gonna be talking about when we talk about performance here today. Now we take our calculation and we get our formula of wattage is equal to the weight multiplied by the power performance level that comes from the 100 that we just selected. We take 11, we multiply it by 100 watts per pound, and we get a total wattage of 1100 watts. I know we're just getting started here. and We've already talked about quite a bit when it comes to this calculation. This is step one. We're gonna move on to step two here, which determines our cell count. Now cell count is very important because this selection in the process ultimately determines the next few steps that we're going to take. Everything is gonna be based off of the cell count. First thing to know is that we do have options to go from a 2S LiPo battery pack all the way to a 12S LiPo battery pack. Now, because I'm talking about LiPo, it doesn't mean that you're only limited to a lithium polymer battery pack. You can select a different battery chemistry. However, we're not gonna cover what happens in that scenario, that situation in this video. We're specifically going to be dialing into only a LiPo battery pack. Now I mentioned here that we're going to use the Patreon RC Calc Sheet chart that is located over here on the right hand side of the board. We'll talk a little bit about this more in a moment. The reason why I created this RC Calc Sheet on the Patreon site is because for the radio control boat power system selection process, a couple of those formulas, and they're coming very soon in our later steps, is a little more complex than the one that we just went through with wattage. And because of that, a few people were not able to make the calculation. So this is going to help out if you need it. You don't need to, everything required here to build the plane and to make the calculations are gonna be within this video. This is totally up to you if you wanna head over here and take a look at what's going on there. I'm gonna continuously update this spreadsheet so that's gonna have all the latest information and help make the decisions that we're gonna be talking about in this video, such as dealing with the capacity and dealing with what kind of battery cell count that we're gonna ultimately select. So if we take a look at that chart right here, this chart is going to give you a range for every cell count. For example, a 2S battery pack is best used for a 30 to 40 inch wingspan airplane. And if you look at an 8S, it's from 84 to 96 inches. What you want to do is use this as a guide. If you have absolutely no idea what kind of cell count that you should be using for your airplane, follow this because this is going to make everything very easy for you. Now you can select values outside of the range that we're providing in this chart. However, if you do that, you would have to know how to deal with things such as what kind of battery capacity are you going to use? Now we'll talk a little bit about that when we move on to the next step, current. However, let's go ahead and make our selection for cell count for our model that is using an 82 inch wingspan. Our 82 inch wingspan falls right here within this range of 68 to 84. And because of that, we can go with that 6S lithium polymer battery pack. A 6S is going to give us the best scenario here for what follows our chart. Now we can talk a little bit about the capacity of the battery. So typically capacities of batteries used in radio control airplanes are about 2200 to 5000 in terms of the range and the unit of measure is milliamp hour. Now if you're following this chart, you can select a capacity based on the wingspan range. For example, we have a range from 2200 to 5000 milliamp hour. We take a look at our our range here, our table, and we have a range of 68 to 84. We're selecting 82. 82 falls really close to the maximum side of this range. 
Therefore, we should be selecting a capacity closer to that 5,000 milliamp hour mark. Now, there's a couple points to make in addition to that. And if you do have room for a bigger capacity pack, that's going to help with the amount of time that you get out of that specific run using a capacity that is larger. However, there's going to be a cost to selecting a bigger battery pack. And that is, it does way more, so your plane is not going to fly as light with that larger pack. There's a couple decisions that you ultimately need to make here, and that's gonna be based off of your plane can actually accept that size of battery. More than likely, if it can accept that size of battery pack and fit within the plane, it probably can fly with it as well. Choose the one that's best suited for you, whether you're going for maximum amount of runtime for with that capacity of pack, or if you want to choose a lighter setup, then you can move from maybe from a 5,000 to a 4,000. In our case, I already know from experience that we're gonna be able to use any type of pack, even from a 2,200 to a 5,000, we could make it work. We're gonna be able to check in the next step how that is possible. Let's jump right into step three, talking about current as well as the capacity again, and we'll throw in C rating for fun as well. In step three, this is the first time where we're gonna solidify our selection when it comes to our battery pack, as well as our electronic speed control. Let's take a look at the steps to do so. First step we gotta do is figure out what kind of current that we're actually gonna get. Well, we already went through the wattage and now we just need to take the wattage and divide it by the nominal voltage. In order to get the nominal voltage, what we do here is we look at the cells and we multiply that by the nominal voltage per cell. This is going to be equivalent to a 6S pack that we've already selected, 6S. We put a six there and we multiply it by 3.7 volts nominal per cell. This is constant for all LiPo battery packs. We talked about this before. We're using LiPo battery packs. If you are too, then this is the number that you use. We calculate that out. We get 22.2 volts nominal. This is for the overall battery pack. We plug that over to our other side here as a nominal voltage. Therefore, we take the 1100 watts that we already know. There's our 1100 watts. This is the information that we're storing as we figure things out. 1100 divided by our 22.2 volts. And now we are left with 49.5 amps. This tells us that in order to achieve the 1100 watts that we've essentially calculated for, we're gonna have to run a 22.2 volt battery pack at 49.5 amps. Now, if you went through this calculation and you did select instead of a 6S pack, you selected an 8S pack, or maybe you selected a 4S pack, it would essentially work the same way. However, if you picked a 4S pack because you have a lower voltage, you're gonna need a higher current in order to get back to the 1100 watts. And that's where the variation there will make a difference for you. So now that we know that, we want to find out what would be a safe ESC current to use. And the safe ESC current would be the calculated amps that we just worked out right here, 49.5 multiplied by 1.2. And this 1.2 represents a safe headroom factor. We don't wanna select a 50 amp speed control that's gonna handle 49.5 amps. So what we do is we multiply that out, we get approximately 60 amps, and we have to select a, an ESC that's got at least 60 amp capacity as a minimum. Anything more than that is going to be good. If it was a 1000 amp speed control, we could use it. So now let's move on to the other part here, which is summarizing our electronic speed control. Our ESC must be capable of that 6S LiPo battery pack. That's important because some ESCs don't go up to 6S. And if you do plug a battery pack into a speed control that can't handle that voltage, there is a potential that that can instantly fry something within the electronic speed control, instantly. So without any warning, you plug it in, it's already dead. So it's best to make sure that you definitely have that proper. When it comes to the current, we already talked about that, minimum 60 amps. Now we can move on to capacity and talk about capacity and relate that back to C rating. We're gonna go with a 4,000 milliamp hour capacity here because let's say it just fits in our airplane and we're trying to minimize the amount of weight within it. So how do you know that a 4,000 will work? That's what that question mark repre represents, a 4,000 milliamp hour battery pack. So this is where we can figure it out based off of our C rating. All we're gonna do is run through the calculation where max current 
in amps divided by capacity multiplied by two is going to give us what kind of C rating as a continuous value that we are going to be looking for when we select our battery pack. So here we run through the calculation, 49.5 multiplied by two divided by four because it's in amp hours that we have to go and plug the value in. 4,000 is milliamp hours, we divide that by 1,000 and that is going to give us the four that you see here. This gives us an answer of 24.75 is going to be the minimum that we have to select. So obviously they don't make a 24.75, we have to move up to something they do offer. And a 25C pack is definitely something they do offer and that's what we would have to select at a minimum. Now, minimum is important here because if you can afford and fit physically as you go up into larger C-rated packs, they do become heavier and bigger as well. So depending on what you're trying to do here, I would prefer to use a larger C rating, but you don't need to do that. You can get away with the 25C. We've already had a factor here of 2.0 to help us have a conservative calculated C rating here. So now I have the question, well, this worked out, 25C makes sense. What happened if you didn't know what you're doing and you selected a 2200 pack for this same setup? Well, we can determine if that's going to be okay, if you're gonna have an issue with the battery or not. This is how we do it. We plug the same stuff back into the calculation here, except the four that we had for 4,000 is gonna turn into a 2.2 after we divide it by 1,000, and we would plug that into our formula. We would arrive at a different C rating. Now, because our battery is actually smaller, our C rating has to be 45C. 45C, they do offer that. They offer approximately up to 60C. Now, it doesn't hurt to point out that as you are looking for a battery pack, there's a lot of manufacturers of battery packs that will advertise 45, 50, 55, 60C, maybe even 90C or something ridiculous. Do keep in mind that this is a value that doesn't have a standard, so be careful with what you're actually buying out there. Get a battery pack that has a reputation based off of feedback on a forum that you've seen or heard of. Now, again, we know that the 45C is out there, it's possible. What happens if you even made more of a mistake? Instead of 2.2 or amp hour or 2200 milliamp hour, you selected a pack that is 1000 milliamp hour. In a airplane this large, going with a 6S 1000 milliamp hour pack is quite a stretch. So I hope you can see that, but if you don't, math saves us. And this is how it does. 49.5 multiplied by that same factor of two divided by one, because I take the 1000 divided by 1000 is gonna give us 90C. If you see anything around 90C for a calculation here, there's not going to be one battery pack out there that can ultimately handle continuous amount of current being pulled from it at a rate of 90C. That's quite an intense value. So this is how you know that it doesn't make sense. If you are new to the hobby, I would stick with making sure that you see values that are even lower than the 45C here that we have. So this is how we ultimately determine a safe ESC as well as a safe battery pack that's going to work for the wattage and the current and the voltage that we just selected for our radio controlled airplane. Now we're ready to move on to the next step. In step four, we go through the recommended RPM as well as the KV that we can calculate from that RPM. This is where that calc sheet might help you out as the formula is a little more complicated than what we've dealt with thus far. The formula that we're gonna use for RPM is equal to 0.4896 multiplied by the wingspan squared, subtract 162.66 multiplied by the wingspan plus 20,786. This is the formula that's gonna give us that RPM. We go and plug our value of 82 for the wingspan that we have right here, 82 inches is our wingspan, and our RPM that we're going to try and hit is going to be 10,740. So now that we have our RPM, this is going to help us out as we move through and determine our KV value. Our KV value that we're looking for is going to come from RPM that we just calculated divided by the nominal voltage of our battery pack. Our nominal voltage is 22, 2.2, that's a 6S pack that we calculated earlier. Now we plug those values in and we get an actual output there of 484. That's gonna be our KV that we're looking for for our setup. Now essentially the motor is locked in and ready to go. One point for anyone who ended up selecting a higher amount of wattage 
for every pound of weight that you have. If you selected 3D performance, this is an airplane that can typically hover right off of the propeller. It's moving a lot of air, but a lot of air at a slower speed. In this case, you are going to want to look at for that type of 3D performance, possibly considering a lower KV or RPM. Both of these values go hand in hand because they're calculated from one another. That lower KV is gonna allow you to use a larger propeller at slower speeds, giving you a lot more thrust to keep the plane in the air on a hover off of the prop. However, if you selected more of like the, you wanna go fast with your airplane and you selected that high performance area, it doesn't matter about the wattage per pound that you ended up selecting. What you ultimately wanna do is consider using a higher KV than the one that has been calculated out here. That higher KV is gonna allow you to match that up with a propeller that's more suitable to moving air faster than moving lots of air to gain thrust. When it comes to fast moving airplanes, thrust is usually not what is maximized. It's more about balancing that pitch speed of the propeller versus the actual thrust that you get. So that's how we can deal with having those different parameters there selected in that first chart. Now we wanna go and summarize what we know about our motor. What we know is that we're looking for an 1100 watt motor that's what it's gotta be capable of. We need it to be for a 6S battery pack. We could check specs on motor manufacturers' websites. Just make sure that they allow the motor to spin up to a 6S type RPM. Some motors may say maximum 15,000 RPM. If it says maximum 15,000 RPM, we are okay. We got some headroom between our RPM here as well as what the maximum is. And then we have the spec there of 484 kV and 50 amps. The 50 amps, you just need to make sure that that motor is rated for 50 amps. If we check all those values and it applies for the motor that we're considering, now we can lock that motor in and buy that motor. Now let's move on to one of our last steps before we summarize here, and that is going to be the propeller selection. Here we are in our final step here. This is our prop selection, step five. Once we have completed this, we've ultimately selected everything for our power system and the last thing to do in this step is to test our power system before our airplane takes flight. So now we're going to go through what we do for our prop selection. First thing we do is we calculate for our propeller diameter. I have a formula here, it works really well, minus 0 0.002 multiplied by the RPM that we calculated in the previous step. That was 10,740 and we sub that into our value here. We add 35.607 and we get 14.127. Now, every time we go and calculate something here, we're always gonna round down to the nearest whole number. If we got 14.9, we're gonna round down to 14 to be conservative. If you're willing to feel a little bit risky there, you can go for it 15 inches, but we should be rounding down to be conservative and then test in our later step. When we have that 14 inch, now we can go into our propeller pitch. And this is essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our diameter, we're just gonna divide that by 1.57. We do that and we get 9.0 inches. Now this is rounded to the nearest half step. So if you ended up at 8.0, 7.5, that would be rounded to 9.0, 8.7 would be rounded to 8.5. Now this is where we can get a little bit of a mix of setup if you ended up wanting a certain style of performance. If you don't know any better, stick with these numbers. If you're going for a faster flight speed, what you may want to consider is dropping your prop diameter by one inch and adding one inch to your prop pitch. Generally speaking, if you go up and down by an equal amount, you're probably going to be okay as it relates to power output. More propeller diameter is going to increase your power, more prop pitch is going to increase the power that the motor pulls. Just because we calculated for 1100 watts doesn't mean we're going to get 1100 watts. This is where we have to go and figure out within our setup what is working. So let's talk about that. You want to go and set up your system and begin testing. Plug in your battery, your speed control, and your motor and throw that propeller on and bench test your airplane. So everything should be in your airplane and you're going to have your airplane buckled down so it doesn't leave the ground. You don't want that thing flying yet. What you're going to do is you're going to test for heat and power. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to make certain that all the components, your battery, your electronic speed control, your motor, are all going to be below 60 Celsius or 140 Fahrenheit on those three components. 
Then what you want to do once you've confirmed after a while that you are always below that value, you want to be measuring power. You can use a data logger or you can use the built-in electronic speed control logger that some ESCs have within them. If your power is low, so in other words, we're looking for 1100 watts and we find that we're only pulling about 700 watts, we want to step up that prop diameter by let's say an inch. Move up to the next prop, you might be stepping up by one inch here and then stepping up by one inch here as well. You want to do this in small increments. So one at a time is preferred. If nothing is available in a 15 by nine, which there is a 15 by nine, then you would have to step up your prop pitch as well. So keep that in mind when you're going through this process. Now, if power is too high, this is the more critical one of the two. If power is too high, you could get into issues with the temperature on one of the components that we calculated for, because we only considered a maximum of 1100 watts. It doesn't mean we're actually going to hit 1100 watts. It's probably best to be just around that value and not over. If you do have yourself finding yourself in a situation where you have too much power, what you want to do is you want to go the opposite direction. Drop the propeller diameter by an inch. Drop the propeller pitch by an inch and then retest. Once you've solidified that, then you can go ahead, grab a friend, grab a buddy, and let them check out your airplane before getting that airplane up into the sky. Let them make that first flight for you if you're uncomfortable, and it should all work out if you selected your power system in this configuration. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna summarize everything that we talked about, because we've gone through a lot within this power system selection for 82 inch wingspan airplane. Let's go ahead and do that right now. All right, we've reached the last part to the conclusion here within the video. I'm gonna go and summarize all of the components that we've essentially selected. And then I got a couple points that are important along the way that I'll share with you. And that will be it for this video. So the light bulb that we ended up selecting is a 6S lithium polymer battery pack with a 4,000 milliamp hour capacity and a C rating of 25C. Make sure that the battery physically fits your aircraft. The motor that we have selected has to be a good for 6S or at least about the 11,000, 12,000 RPM. Now, motor manufacturers aren't going to give you both of those specifications typically. As long as you can satisfy either one, you are going to be good so you don't have issues with RPM. The other point that's as important is you want to make sure the motor is capable of 50 amps and 1100 watts. Now, if the current as well as the voltage check out, you should have a motor that's good for 1100 watts. And all of this is continuous amount of power. Last specification that's important is that 484 kV. Now, odds are you won't be able to find a motor that's exactly 484 in its kV. And you can vary by plus or minus 5%. You can go outside that range as well. You just need to note that this this is going to affect your prop selection in the next step. The next component here is the ESC. It has to be capable of 6S. That is a hard stop. It must be capable of 6S. and has to be a 60 amp minimum. Earlier, we talked about having a 1000 amp speed control. Yes, you can do that. However, that 1000 amp speed control is going to be very heavy and probably not be able to fit quite easily within your plane. Now, our prop selection is going to be a 14 by nine. Now, this is the first prop that we want to start with if we are able to get specifications that match everything that we've calculated. If we have a KV that is higher, as we mentioned, maybe it's 550 that we end up, which is above that 5% mark, then we're going to have to consider making a selection here that is lower than the 14 by 9, maybe selecting a 13 by 9 or 13 by 8. This here is the prop that you want to use to start. This should not ever be the final or last propeller that this plane uses. You should change the propeller based off of the performance that you see when you measure that type of performance. Move up in size if your power is too low, move down in size if your power is too high or your motor is too hot or your battery as well as the speed control. Last point here is on the Patreon website. I'll leave a link down below. We have the RC Calc Sheet version 1.012 or higher that is going to contain the calculations that will make this easier to go through. Important point here is that this is updated monthly, this calc sheet, and I'm gonna continuously update this specific section to handle the RC airplane power system selection process to make it easier so that everything is essentially summarized on one sheet for you so that you can go through all these calculations 
quite simply and quite quickly. So you don't need to do that. Ultimately, you can use what we've covered in this video and that will give you all of the answers that we've essentially gone through here today. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this educational type video on how to select a power system for a radio controlled airplane. As always, like the video if you do. Don't forget to hit that sub button so that I can see you guys in that next video. Thanks a lot for watching. See you in the next one.